One of the greatest gifts our parents gave us was a healthy marriage. And I'd say the same is true for each of you today. Then one of the greatest things you can give your kids today is a healthy, great marriage. It's true, and here's why. Because healthy marriages lead to healthy families. Healthy families lead to healthy societies. I would argue a lot of the reason why we're seeing the Western world deteriorate like it is, is because there's been attack on the nuclear family. It's time to focus on the family again. Oh, good morning, good morning. You can go ahead and find your seats. I, uh, I thought this morning would be the perfect opportunity to set the record straight on a story that I've shared on this stage before, and I realize every time I've shared it, I've actually never shared the ending, and people are asking, like, what happens at the end? So I'm sure some of you are going to be familiar with this story. Others of you may not be, but I'll give you the cliff notes for those of you who aren't. Uh, I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia. My senior year of high school, I liked a girl. She lived in Texas. Her name was Laurie Young at the time. She's currently standing next to me on this stage, so I did something right. But I come home one day, I liked her, I didn't know if she liked me, and my family bombarded me, and they're like, Sam, you need to ask Laurie to go to prom with you. And I'm like, that's a pretty bold move, because she would have to fly here, and they're like, you need to do it. So we're just texting at first, it's small talk, she's responding, and we're laughing together. And then I, I get too nervous, so I hand the phone to my older brother, he writes a text that starts off with, I've got the opportunity of a lifetime for you. This is true. Gives the details of prom and says, it's okay if you say no, because I've got a line of girls waiting outside of my house right now. <laughs> so my family's by me, we're waiting for the text back, 30 minutes goes by, no response, an hour goes by, no response, an hour and a half goes by. My mom is the only person standing next to me. She pats me on the back and says, it's okay, bud, you guys can just be friends. <laughs> and so I thought it'd be fantastic, Laurie, if you shared with the world why you ghosted me for two hours. It was unintentional. Uh-huh. But I got the text and I was like, we, we, we had been talking for a while, but like we, we flirted just a little bit. So that was pretty bold. And I was like, there's no way this is him. Which, Which kind of you were right, wasn't, technically, because okay? it was and, <laughs> and so I turned my phone off, kind of out of fear. I never had a boyfriend or anything before, so I was like, "Oh my gosh, I just turned my phone off." Well, then I turned it back on because I was like, "I probably maybe he was serious." And so I opened it and I sent you a text. We literally still have it screenshotted, and I and it says, "Or right, if you're seriously serious about prom." <laughs> I would love to go with you, but I just got to ask my mom and dad first. That's yeah. what I said. And I'm like, why couldn't you have told me that two hours earlier? Thanks a lot. <laughs> but she came to prom. We had an amazing time. And, and before she flew back to Texas, I, I wanted to ask her to be my girlfriend. I wanted to DTR, you know, define the relationship. But before I asked her, I wanted to ask for her dad, Pastor Ed's blessing. And uh, I had only had a few interactions with Pastor Ed. So I'm, you know, terrified. I'm a teenage kid and my voice is shaky. My hands are perspiring. I pick up the phone and call. And I'm like, hey, Pastor Ed, this is Sam. We had a great time at prom last night. Got her back by curfew. In fact, well before curfew. It was great. And uh, was just wondering if I could have your blessing to ask her to be my girlfriend. And I'm expecting, you know, like, like scripture to come back at me. Like, yeah, sure, but if you do these 37 things, then you can date my daughter. And in classic Pastor Ed fashion, his response was, man, ain't nothing to it. Just do it, my man. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, you just gave me away like that, that sounds, Dad? That sounds great. I think the follow-up question was like, do you like to fish? And I was like, no, but I can. If that's what you like, I will do whatever you, you like to do. Uh, fast forward, December 30th, 2015, we say our I do's, and it wasn't just the merging of, of our lives, but it was really the merging of the Kelly family and the Young family. And, and thankfully, we're not naive enough to try and stand on this stage and, and think that we've got everything in marriage and family and kids figured out. Although we do have a book coming out on raising teenagers. We don't have any teenagers. We just feel like we know what it's like. Um, that's a joke. Some hesitated laughs. They're like, ha I hope they're joking. We are. We're, we're by no means experts, are we? No, we are not. But we both have come from just great, healthy families with great marriages. And so y'all know, obviously, my parents, Ed and Lisa Young, they're pretty great, okay? They are great. But Sam's family, he's actually also a pastor's kid as well. And so his parents pastor a church in Virginia Beach, Virginia called Wave Church. And they've been pastoring there for over 30 years. And his siblings are on staff there. And it's a phenomenal church. But our our families didn't just happen out of thin air that they were great. They were all centered around Christ. Yeah. And um, our, we watched our parents keep God first, marriage second, and kids third. And you might think kids third after marriage, that doesn't make sense. But I'm telling you, 
that both of us can say this, one of the greatest gifts our parents gave us was a healthy marriage. And I'd say the same is true for each of you today. Then one of the greatest things you can give your kids today is a healthy, great marriage. It's true, and here's why. Because healthy marriages lead to healthy families. Healthy families lead to healthy societies. I would argue a lot of the reason why we're seeing the Western world deteriorate like it is is because there's been attack on the nuclear family. It's time to focus on the family again. And I am thankful, I'm so thankful that we're a part of a church that prioritizes the family, that speaks to the family. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, well, I am already disappointed because I don't come from a great family. Uh, in fact, my marriage currently kind of feels like it's hanging on by a thread. And I would encourage you with the reality that one of the greatest promises that the resurrection of Jesus Christ comes with is first and foremost salvation to the believer, but secondly, it's the reminder that God has the ability and the authority to bring dead things back to life. And maybe you feel like you've got a dead marriage, maybe you feel like you've got a relationship with a son or a daughter that is too far gone. I'm here to tell you, if you keep Christ at the center of your life, there is no telling what he can do in and through your family, your marriage, and whatever else in your life. And so here's what we wanna do this morning. We wanna walk through six disciplines that we saw our parents model in their marriage that led to what we believe is a healthy marriage and a healthy family. Now you may hear some of these and think, okay, well, I've got some work to do. Well, the reality is we've all got some work to do. We can all grow and learn and get better. And maybe you're here and you're like, I'm not married. Well, I'm here to tell you the way you live today is setting up yourself for future success. And maybe you'll hear some of these things and think, man, I can't do this. Well, what I want to encourage you with is that none of us can do this without the help and the horsepower of the Holy Spirit. So if you're a parent in the room, one simple prayer I'd encourage you to start your day off with is simply this. You could be a single mom, a single dad, a couple, a blended family. God, grant us the ability to lead our family well today. The first discipline we want to talk through is the discipline of a love for God and his house. Yes, and that's kind of the foundational discipline of all the disciplines that we talk about this morning. And I love the story of Joshua in the Bible. Joshua is towards the end of his life. Um, he's about to die, and he has um, the Israelites who he's talking to in this scripture that we're about to read, and the Israelites have turned their back on God. And so he's talking, and he kind of gives this speech, and kind of the crescendo of the speech is found in Joshua 24, 15. It says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And I love this part right here. But it's for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I love that Joshua, as you look at this, made a decision for his entire family. And to the parents in the room, you have to make a decision who you and your family are going to serve. I am so thankful that we had parents that made the decision that said, as for us in our house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And I know, you know some of you are like, okay, but you're pastor's kids, you kinda of had to. Well, if you think this pastor's kid wanted to show up to church every single Sunday, Wednesday, and really every other day of the week, you would be sadly mistaken. Uh, but beyond that, that wasn't the story for my parents. Neither my mom nor my dad were raised in a Christian household. And in fact, my dad was raised by two alcoholics that owned a bar. <laughs> So you can imagine the kind of dysfunction that he was raised in. And he says that when he was 17 years old, he was invited to church. He did not want to go whatsoever, but his, his friends were forcing him to go with him. So he went to the bar before he went to church so he could remember as little as possible. He, he jokes that the service was so long that he began to sober up uh, as the service continued. And at the end of uh, that church service, the pastor gave an invitation uh, for those who wanted to surrender their lives to Christ. My dad raised his hand and walked forward and that day uh, completely changed and transformed his life. And my dad at that time in his life didn't know what a healthy family looked like. And it was the power of the church that he got to rub shoulders with other healthy families that he got to begin to see, oh, oh, this is what a family can actually look like. 
And I wouldn't be standing here on this stage doing what I'm doing today if it wasn't for my dad making that decision to make God's house a priority in his life. I've heard it said this way, what one generation deems as optional, the next generation deems as unnecessary. So so parents, if you view church attendance and growing actively in your faith as optional, don't be surprised when your kids view it as unnecessary. We need some Joshua type dads that understand that you set the tone and your antenna for the spirituality of your family that are going to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Absolutely. And moms of littles. So we have, like my dad said in the video, a five-year-old little boy named Thunder, a three-year-old little boy named Dodge, and then a one-year-old precious little girl named Bowie, who's the princess of the family. But She's the best. Yes. She's going to have whatever she wants. It's going to be a problem. <laughs> um, and especially because she's a little one, yeah, you know? Um, but getting to church on a Sunday morning is anything but easy. It is hard. There's kicking and screamings, moms of littles, you know how it is. And I even like, I'm OCD, like my mom said. I lay out the outfits. I like have snacks prepared because our kids are here a little bit longer. And somehow it's always kicking and screaming, getting them out the door on a Sunday morning. And sometimes I think, man, is this really worth it for an hour or two of childcare? <laughs> like just being honest with you. And then I'm quickly reminded, oh my goodness, what they are learning is so valuable. Yeah. Like they are in FC Kids right now learning about God's word and the truth of God. And so I can easily think like that, but I think about that and I'm like, you know what, even the thought of them on a Sunday morning seeing us come to church and prioritize God at the start of our week is huge. And we're helping and training them for later on in life. And Sam and I as pastor's kids, we got a front row seat to seeing a lot of things happen at church and a lot of amazing things happen. Like there's people come to mind of just marriages that people that walked in and their marriage is on the breach of divorce and it's hard. Or, and I see them lean into the church and their marriage healed or people that have lost loved one and received so much comfort from the church. And so I think about like you and I, and I'm like, we'd be crazy not to lean on the church. We've seen so many amazing stories come from it. And I want what everyone else has gotten. So true. And the flip side of that too is uh, as pastors, kids, we've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. And we still love the church. Some people say the church is full of hypocrites. And I'm like, yep. And there's room for one more too. You want to come and join us? (laughs) That's so Um, true. But that's the reality. And I look at in 2024, it's like the church is under so much scrutiny in so many ways. And I'm like, can we just take a step back and look at the 30,000 foot perspective of the local church? There is no other entity that has brought more good in the world than the local church. Schools, hospitals, uh, nonprofit organizations, all of them largely backed by the local church. I love the church. We're products of the local church. The second discipline we want to talk about is the discipline of commitment. Commitment. And I remember growing up, and many of you may have heard my dad say this, but he would would always say, you know, marriage, you spell marriage, W-O-R-K. And growing up, I'm like, no, you don't. Marriage looks fun. You don't spell it work. And then I got married. Okay. No, we wow. would say the same thing. Okay. That's so encouraging today, yeah. babe. But it does require work. And you don't <laughs> think that going in, but it does. Yeah, it does. And uh, I think about the passage in Genesis when speaking to marriage. It, it says that two shall become one. And in the honeymoon phase of marriage, you're like, that sounds awesome. And then you get seven years in and you're like, oh, this is actually really challenging because it's Uh, Marriage is this lifelong bond and union of two very different personalities, two very different experiences coming together to be one emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, and that's not always easy. So I guess like practically, what are some of the steps that people can take uh, to see that take place? My, I, I saw my parents model Christian counseling so well. And so when we got engaged, I remember saying, Sam, we need to go to Christian counseling. And I was like, are things that bad? Is there something I don't know about? And I'm like, no, it's preventative. And you catch the small things before they become big things. And that was just something I was modeled. So I remember we went and um, we were having a discussion. Yeah. An elevated conversation. (laughs) Wasn't a fight. Just an elevated conversation. About money. Which who argues over money? Okay. Nobody. Um, 
And so I remember our- All the nervous laughs. laughs. Yeah. <laughs> I remember our counselor said, looked at us and said, can you both individually tell me your first memory of money? <laughs> and I was like, my first memory of money? Oh, I, I remember my- I had this little orange, like, safe piggy bank, and any birthday money, any um, thing from doing chores that I got went into this little safe, and I was a psycho and counted it every night. Yeah, so I married a saint who, by the age of five years old, had saved up $500. It's like, she may as well have been a multimillionaire at that age. You want to know what my first memory was? Uh, when I was eight or nine years old, I did a voiceover for, like, a, a Christian movie uh, that was animated. Uh, I'm, I'm an actor, but that's not the point of this sermon, okay? We're going to keep moving. But I, I, said like, I said like three lines, and I got $300. And as an eight-year-old, I'm like, I'm Elon Musk. I can buy the world. And I'll never forget, my dad comes up to me, and he's like, hey, bud, uh, you got two options. You could either save this money you know, for your, for your future, be responsible, or you know that dirt bike you wanted? You could buy that. I'm like, let's get the dirt bike, Dad. So within a matter of 30 seconds, I had spent every penny that I knew. And, uh, I, you know, Laurie thinks about the future, security. You're fine. I like to think that I'm biblical because Jesus says we're only promised today. Don't worry about tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks for the three laps, or claps. I appreciate that. But, but here's the reality. You know, that's funny. But being unified is, is oftentimes a real, a real challenge. And sure, like, I think it is a healthy to be able to agree to disagree on some things, but the majors, you want to be a unified front. And some simple ways that we even saw that modeled within uh, our parents when I was younger is uh, when my parents would make a decision for the family, my dad would never uh, say the phrase of like, hey, you know, I wanted to do this, but your mom said this is what we've got to do. Here's, here's the words that I would hear. Your mother and I have decided this is what we're doing. And as a young boy, I was seeing, even without realizing it at the time, oh, my parents are a unified front. Uh, some other things that I think are super helpful are just a date night, uh, once a week, getting away from the kids and just focusing on each other, um, going on trips. Our parents always would go on trips. And uh, as a kid, again, you're like, I want to go to Mexico. You guys are mean. Do you not even love us? But as a kid, you get to see that our parents are prioritizing their most important human relationship. The next discipline we want to talk through is, this is a fun one, the discipline of discipline. Of discipline. And boy, do stories come to mind when I think about discipline. And we, Sam and I were talking about the topic of discipline this week. And we are talking about how we need, we need to bring back like 90s discipline. Like, like when belts had names. It, you know what I mean? I did not say that. What? Who said that? <laughs> but there's like soft parenting nowadays. <laughs> That's I true. guess that's our generation, yeah. I don't know. Okay, which, if we can just talk about that for a second, okay? <laughs> We've got little kids. We understand, you go to a restaurant, you know, our kids are throwing forks, they're throwing food. We don't go to many restaurants. But I do think it's funny sometimes when you go to a restaurant and you see, like, the parent go up to the kid who's, like, throwing a temper tantrum, throwing forks at, like, people's heads that are at a different table. And the parent's like, hey, why are you throwing a fork? Are you a little up? I'm like, I don't care why my son's throwing a fork. He needs to know he can't. And I'm not saying that we publicly berate our children, but we will take them aside and say, hey, these are some things that you're not going to do. Chances are they're five and three. They're going to throw a fork again. We'll leave the restaurant early. But anyway, she just yes. said soft parenting, and I had to you had find a soapbox moment. <laughs> um, but I remember um, one time, so there's four of us kids, right? And my mom takes all four of us to the park to ride bikes, and she loads up the back of her Suburban with all these bikes. And when we get home after we're done riding bikes, she tells all the kids, all right, kids, you have to unload all these bikes tonight because tomorrow morning we have a big day and I need these bikes unloaded from the car. So sure enough, none of us obeyed and took the bikes out. <laughs> so she comes up the, the next morning and she's like, you guys did not take the bikes out of the car. And she was frustrated. So she's like getting the bikes, putting them on the ground, getting the bikes, unloading them on the ground. And then I was like probably like nine at the time and I was dramatic and I had a diary. That's not a good combo. It's a dangerous combination. <laughs> and so I wrote, I remember later that afternoon, I was like, dear diary, dear journal, my mom is the absolute worst. She is so rude. She was throwing our bikes out of the car and almost killed our dog. Little sweet. <laughs> Promise. And so I said that, and, which is so untrue. And when you're one of four kids, your journal's not private. It circulates. <laughs> and my dad got my journal, and he, and he was like, Oh my, reading it. And he was like, oh my goodness, Laurie, you're lying. You're, t you're gossiping. You're telling things that are not true. From now on, 
you have to write instead of dear journal, dear diary, you have to write dear God and pray because I know you will not lie and gossip to God. And he was right. And so sure, I'm like, dear God, thank you for my family. <laughs> <laughs> they're great. Yes, they're amazing. But is now being a parent, I'm like, thankful that my parents disciplined me because it's hard work. It's easier just kind of let them go. That's true. Hebrews 12, 11 says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. And as a kid, I mean, I definitely felt that. But then it continues. It says, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Discipline is actually a gift. And parents, if you don't prioritize it in your family, you're actually doing your kids a disservice. Uh, The next discipline we want to talk through is the discipline of purity. Yes. And just a couple weeks ago, you heard my parents on this stage talk about the Ten Commandments of purity. And I love that They've been speaking that those commandments for years. I grew up hearing them, and now that I'm married, I appreciate them so much more. And some people look at those and see those commandments and are like, that's pretty extreme. That, I don't know about that one. And from my perspective, I'm like, okay, and same with your parents. Our, both of our parents have been married to each other for over 40 years and have yep. been faithful to one another. So call it extreme. It works, and it's amazing. And I'm so, so grateful for that. But when Sam and I started dating right after um, you asked me to be your girlfriend, (laughs) after prom, great moment, um, Sam took me aside and was like, okay, our goal is purity before marriage. And so I would love to set up some boundaries to keep us from the edge um, of that line. And so we just made a couple of these. Um, One of them was I remember trouble after 12, because what good happens after 12 a.m.? Totally. So we just didn't hang out. two teenagers who like each other. I'm yeah, like, we didn't hang out. I just don't out. trust myself. So after we're gonna, 12. And if you're, you know, if you're a, a student in the room and your, your parents are like, it's not 12, it's 10, listen to your parents. Yes, obey, trust us. <laughs> um, but we wouldn't be at a home alone if we um, went to Sam's parents' house when I, we lived in Virginia Beach. Uh, we'd make a giant U-turn if they weren't home yeah. and we'd call them. Um, or we wouldn't be in a room with the door closed. And I challenged just young adults here make those, especially with dating, those um, boundaries. Yeah, and we wanted to do this again because we wanted to prioritize what God prioritizes. That, that was our goal. And by the grace of God, both Laurie and I were virgins when we got married. And I don't say that to brag. I say it to say this, that God's way is not only possible, it's actually better. Jesus doesn't want to rob you of your pleasure. He actually wants to fulfill it in ways you couldn't dream or imagine. So students in the room, you want to make a difference and stand out for Christ in your school, take a stand for purity. I promise you, people will start to notice. Or or maybe you're like, okay, well, I've already messed up in that department. Well, guess what? You can choose today to model a life of purity. And to the parents, if I could speak to the poison of pornography in 2024, back in the day, you used to have to go searching for it. Well, now it is searching for your son, your daughter, and you. So the question is, what boundaries are you going to set up to make sure that, again, you stay away from that poison? The fifth discipline is the discipline of being present. In 2007, someone stood on a stage and announced something that would change the world forever. Uh, The someone was Steve Jobs. The something was the iPhone, also known as a weapon of mass distraction. (laughs) Now, I'm not, I'm not here to bash technology. There are so many amazing sides to technology, but we do have to understand this. Our attention is a product being sold. And because of that, many of us are living distracted lives, and it is taking us away from the most important relationships that we have. Humor me for a moment and listen to this definition of addiction and think about your phone. The relentless pull to a substance or activity that becomes so compulsive, it ultimately interferes with everyday life. Now, before you're like, that's not me, remember the first sign of addiction is denial. Got (laughs) him. Yes, on average, a person touches their smartphones up to 2,617 times a day. An average teenager spends nine hours a day on technology, which is 24 years by the end of their life, and we're six times more likely to get in a car wreck texting and driving rather than drunk and driving. And teens who use their phones seven hours or more a day are twice as likely to be diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And more studies show that when we feel depressed or anxious, Oftentimes, we turn to our phones 
which are only making matters worse. So sometimes we just need a break. Yeah. And we're in the middle of camp out of Lhasa Ranch, and it's been absolutely amazing. And, and one of the coolest things is uh, students don't have their phones out there. And I can promise you, no teenager is excited to turn their phone over for a week. But at the end of it, it it's like they had a detox. They're a different human being just from being separated and, and not being engulfed in a screen, but looking at individuals eye to eye. Uh, I, one of my favorite trips uh, was a couple of years ago. My dad and my brother found out about this trip where you can ride dirt bikes through the wilderness and woods of California for five days, and on the fifth day, you ride through Yosemite Nat National Park. It's one of the coolest things I've ever done, but a prerequisite to the trip is you have to go and hand over your phone, and they put it in a lockbox, and if I can be honest, that moment was a little bit more uncomfortable than I'd be willing to admit. I'm like, oh gosh, okay, here we go. And to me, it was actually one of the highlights of the trip, just being able to be present, the conversations that I had with my dad around the campfire, the conversations I had with my brother, the, the, the reality of just living in nature and being in the moment. And I think in 2024, we have lost that gift. And so I would just uh, think like, what are some practical ways that you as a family, that you as a married couple, that you as a dating couple can think through ways to just be present? Maybe it's a technology curfew for you and your family. Maybe it's no phones at the dinner table. Maybe it's no phones in the bedroom so that you can just be present. Yes, and it's so easy, moms of young kids, to just hand, we joke that the iPad's the third parent because <laughs> they'll just keep them quiet for a little bit and our boys are crazy and I'm like, can you just sit still? Let's just put a show on. <laughs> That's real. Um, but something recently we've done and it's difficult, but we do no shows or TVs during those weekdays and on the weekends they get to watch TV. It's working so far. Talk to us in a couple more months. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's difficult. And as parents, we're not just responsible for our kids' spiritual presence. We're also responsible for our kids' social presence. So so many, so often I feel like technology just makes you recluse. And I love my parents growing up before we'd go into a place, and I try to do this with my kids as well, but specifically church. On the way to church, or even when we're about to go up to talk to someone, she's like, all right, you're about to see a lot of people. You need to stand up straight. You yeah. need to look at people in the eyes, stick out your hand, shake their hand. And, and it was her instilling this confidence in me. And, yeah. and also it's a lost art. Yeah. Like that's a gift. But the um, sixth discipline is the discipline of perseverance. The discipline of perseverance. James 1, 2 through 4 says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. James says, when you go through pain, get ready to rejoice. And either James is crazy or James knows something. And in the text, you see that he knows something because when you go through pain, it has the ability to produce perseverance. And when you persevere, it brings a maturity that you wouldn't have had if not for persevering through that pain. And as parents, and I understand this, sometimes we wanna shield our kids from pain, but the reality of life is pain isn't probable, it's promised. So rather than shielding them from pain, rather than shielding them from suffering, maybe it's better to teach them how to suffer well. I'm thankful that our parents didn't shield us from pain, but they also didn't shield us from the solution, which is Jesus. Yes, and you'll have often heard my parents talk about how they lost my older sister, Lee Beth, three years ago. And that was so difficult for our entire family and us and just navigating that. And I watched my parents navigate that with Jesus and, yeah. and through this path where there still was pain, but there was joy that existed through Jesus. And it was hard, like still to this day, we have immense pain and we also lost our little girl. At 14 weeks, I delivered our little girl named Daisy two years ago, so a year after Lee Beth died. And that was hard. And I am so grateful for, the, for watching my parents that other year in yeah. between when my sister died and then we lost our little girl. And I, I watched them model how to, how to walk through hard things. And you know, we have suffered, but I will say we have suffered well. And I'm thankful for that. And we have, um, absolutely, our faith has been tested, but we have persevered. And it's difficult, but with Jesus, you can. And I'm so thankful that our family is still standing and that we're still seeing lost people come home because that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I'm sure the same is true for many people in this room. Been through tremendous pain. Yeah. 
but sometimes, sometimes just being able to say and, and, and realize that I'm still standing. I'll never forget, um, shortly after Lee Beth passed away, Laurie wanted to get some closure. And so she went over to Lee Beth's house. And I'll, I will never forget the phone call I got after she went to her house. Through tears, uh, she just said over the phone, you take nothing with you. All the stuff is just stuff. And in a moment like that, perspective of what really matters in this life is slammed right in front of your face. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, a wise man leaves an inheritance not just for his children, but for his children's children. And when I look at that passage, I don't think about money. I think about the inheritance of a legacy that we are living in. The legacy of parents that have said through painful situations, through the highs and lows of life, our, our family is going to be a house that serves God and serves his house. And now our kids are walking in that inheritance and legacy as well. So the question of the morning is this, what legacy do you want to leave? Maybe that's not your legacy that you're living in right now. Well, guess what? You can start to create that legacy for not just your children, but your children's children. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every family member represented here, every husband, every wife, every son, every daughter. God, you see us and you know us, and we're thankful for that today. Maybe you're in this room this morning and you have yet to make a decision to make Jesus the center of your life. It's impossible to do what we just talked through without first taking that step. I'd encourage you to pray this prayer after me. You don't have to say it out loud. You can just say it in the confines of your heart, but just say, Jesus, today I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I believe that that Savior is you. I believe you died on a cross for my sins, and three days later you rose again from the grave. And today I choose to follow you. God, once more, I just say thank you and through the pains of life, I pray that we would be people who would remember what matters most, that we would leave a legacy of loving you and loving your house. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for watching the Ed Young YouTube channel. That's right. And if you want to be inspired, encouraged, and challenged like never before, subscribe and click the notification button. We believe this channel can help change your life. 